we're proud to bring this to you uh, in conjunction with uh, FSA and uh, NDSU Extension. Uh, from NDSU, we have um, Ron Haugen, if he's uh, if his technical difficulties don't prevent him from presenting here. Um, myself, I'm, my name's Brian Parman. I'm the State Ag Finance Specialist for NDSU. And then we have Miranda Meehan, who is also going to be helping moderate and uh, uh, run the run the webinar as well. From FSA, we have Laura Heinrich, uh, Brad Tickison, Lin uh, Lindsay Abentroth, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, Wanda Brayton, Ron Duvall, and Jay. His last name's a little more difficult to pronounce, so I was told to just uh, call him Jay. So with uh, most of our presenters, uh, five to anywhere between five and 20 minutes, and I encourage everyone, if, if, you're a, if you're able to turn your mics on, make sure you leave them off. And again, at the end, hold, you can go ahead and type your questions into the uh, chat portion, which uh, uh, we'll, we'll take those and we'll have a list of them. And then at the end, we'll go down and, and each presenter will be, uh, the questions will be directed towards them and then they can go ahead and answer them. So with that, I wanna go ahead and kick this off with, uh, with Laura. Thank you, Brian. And we, um, from FSA, we want to thank NDSU for putting this webinar together um, to assist us in getting this important information out on the coronavirus food assistance program. Um, I, I am Laura Heinrich. Um, I'm a state program director for the North Dakota Farm Service Agency, and I'm in charge for in charge of the overall administration of uh, CFAP, as we call it, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or CFAP. Uh, I'll be covering some general information about the program, and then each um, section or each commodity will be covered by one of our state specialists or program directors. So with that, you can go to the next slide, Brian. So CFAP provides direct assistance to agricultural producers impacted by the effects of the COVID-19 outbreak. There's two funding sources for the program. The first is the CARES Act um, funds, and that's nine and a half billion dollars that was allocated to compensate for losses due to price declines that occurred between mid-January and mid-April of 2020. The second funding source is CCC charter funds, and the secretary has allocated 6.5 billion dollars in CCC funds to assist producers based on costs of dealing with ongoing market disruptions and that tr transition back to an orderly marketing system. Sign up for the program did start May 26, 2020, and our county offices have been actively um, accepting those applications, getting them entered in the system and approved. The sign up does end August 28th. So all producers wanna make sure that they get their applications completed and submitted to the county office by August 28th of 2020. Producers with an ownership risk of identified commodities that suffered a 5% or greater national price loss as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic or had substantial marking costs of inventories and who produce or own one of the following commodities, milk, non-specialty crops, wool, livestock, or specialty crops will be eligible for the program. And even though that commodity may be eligible, there's a new term um, to identify which portion of that um, production will be eligible. So all production, sales, and inventory of eligible non-specific, non-specialty crops, wool, livestock, and specialty crops must be subject to price risk as of January 15, 2020. This term price risk is something new that we haven't um, generally used in FSA programs before. We know this has um, generated a lot of concern out there with producers on what production is eligible and what isn't. And so as our presenters go through each um, different co eligible commodity, they'll go into more detail on what production is eligible in definition of price risk. There's several forms that will need to be completed um, to be eligible for CFAB. The first is the application itself or the AD3114. Um, producers will also need to submit a farm operating plan for payment eligibility if they haven't done so already. If they're a member of, a, of an entity, they'll need to provide um, 
information about the who makes up that legal entity or the members of that entity by filing a CCC 901. They'll also need to um, certify to their adjusted gross income using the form CCC 941. And if applicable, they may need to also certify to what portion of their income comes from farming, ranching, and forestry using the CCC 942. And then the last form that producer may have to file or will need to file is an 801026, um, which is our highly erodible and wetland certification form. It's really important for producers to remember that they do need to file all of those eligibility forms within 60 days of the date of signing that application. Um, if they do not um, submit those eligibility forms timely, they will not be eligible for a payment or it may be at a reduced payment rate. Producers are gonna file one application per producer, which will contain all production for all eligible commodities from all counties that that producer has an interest in. The producer is gonna do, um, they're certifying to all of the information on the form, so all the production on the form, it's a certification. We will not be um, accepting any production evidence documentation at this time. It'll only be required if that producer is selected by spot check or when the county committee requests it. The producer can submit the completed um, CFAP application to any service center, um, but the recording county or the producer's control county will be the, the county that will actually approve or act on that application. Uh, this is just a example of the form. Part A is just um, the producer should read through that to know exactly what they are certifying to when they sign the form. Um, in part I. Part B is where they're gonna enter in their, um, the producer's name and address. Part C through G are, we'll go through in, um, as we cover each individual commodity in more detail. Part H is on the second page, is where the producer um, will need to file additional information for payment limitation purposes and Ron will go through that in, in the next section. If you wanna go to the page two, Brian, thank you. Um, and then part I is where the producer is signing and dating, um, certifying that they all the information on the application is correct and agreeing to maintain any um, production evidence for three years in case they're selected for spot check. Um, payments will be based on specific payment rates by commodity and we'll cover that as we go through each section um, for the commodity. And they'll be paid at 80% of the calculated payment. Um, subsequent payments may be issued at a later date determined by the secretary if funding is available. And we know there's a lot of rumors out there, but this program is not first come first serve. We're doing this 80% um, 80 of the calculated payment rate to make sure that all um, producers will receive um, will be receive the payments that they're eligible for. And then again, after um, the sign up has ended, the secretary will review to see if we can increase that payment percentage from 80% and go all the way up to 100%. With that, I'll turn it over to Ron Duvall to cover payment limitation, payment eligibility, and conservation compliance. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Ron Duvall. I'm the state uh, program director for payment eligibility, payment limitation, and conservation compliance. So this morning we're going to talk about uh, the payment eligibility rules as, as they apply to the CFAP program. <clears throat> so the, the, what the rules that do apply to the uh, CFAP program regarding payment limitation is that we we will follow all the payments down through the fourth level of ownership through attribution. And that's no, not much different. That really is not any different than what we do in any of our other programs. So what we, what we follow is what well, we'll get to that here uh, on a, on a different slide, but, and then we're going to follow payment eligibility with the payment eligibility, the foreign personal rules apply. And like I said, we'll get to that again. This is just an overview. And then the adjusted gross income rules apply. 
the 900,000 AGI unless 75% of your AGI is determined from uh, farming. And the AGI, again, is adjusted gross income. What I, what I do want to mention, though, is that rules that do not apply are um, common attribution for minors. So minors are eligible for this program. Uh, we're not looking at substantive change. We're not looking at active engaged in farming rules. Um, and we're not looking at cash rent tenant or any other cropland factor things that may be applied in the county office. Now, to be eligible for CFAP, um, a producer has to have a share in an eligible commodity on January 15th and or um, April 16th through May 14th. And then they also have to be a citizen of the US, right, or national, a resident alien. Uh, we have to have, uh, it must be a partnership of citizens or US nationals, a corporations, uh, limited liability corps, Indian tribes, or a foreign person or foreign entity who meets the foreign person rules according to our handbook. And if, if anyone has any questions regarding your eligibility, feel free to reach out to your county office or you could reach out to our state office here and we'd be glad to talk to you about your eligibility. Now, ineligible producers are um, federal and state local governments. Um, or public schools, which, which are included in that. Uh, personal legal entities who do not have reported ownership in an eligible commodity on those dates, those folks aren't eligible. Uh, persons and legal entities suspended or debarred from otherwise um, are, are excluded from federal programs, those folks are not eligible. And uh, persons and legal entities that do not meet payment limitation, payment eligibility, AGI, or um, wetland compliance requirements. Those people will not be eligible either. <clears throat> so the general rule for the CFAP program, the general rule as far as payment limitation is concerned is that the total amount of CFAP payments that a person or a legal entity excluding general partnerships and joint ventures may receive is $250,000. Now payments to joint operations, um, including general partnership or joint venture cannot exceed 250,000 per person um, or the legal entity that's part of that. So what we're looking for is the, we're looking at all of our payments always follow back to a social security number. And that's really what this is getting to is that we're going to follow the payments back. So if um, we have a general partnership that has three members, that general partnership is gonna earn 250,000 times three. If we could move to the next slide. Now we do have an optional increase and this is new for us at FSA. Um, this is the, f the first time I've run into this, and, and as far as I know, it's the first time we've really uh, made a change regarding corporations. So on the form, you can see down on the bottom of this, this slide that Part H, that, that we are allowing, FSA is allowing um, corporations and limited, limited liability companies and limited liability partnerships to earn an additional $250,000 limitation for applicants or, or, or on, on this program. And that, that's new. Normally, a corporation would be limited to just one payment limit. But in this case, this, is, this program is written so that, that one corporation can earn three payment limits. But we're going to go on the next slide through the details of that. <clears throat> And so that optional limit increase um, can, can move up to either five, from 250 to 500 or 750, depending on how involved the members are in that, in that entity. So when you have an entity that has, that's comprised of multiple members, we could pay up to three member, three payment limits, for, the, for three members if those members 
or stockholders or partners contribute 400 hours or more of active personal labor, active personal management, or a combination of the three. <clears throat> so what we have here is a, there's a, a chart to just explain how that works. Normally, if none of the members in a corporation provide any labor or any management, um, that partnership, limited partnership, corporation, LLC would earn one payment limit, $250,000. Now, if you, have a, if you have a corporation, I'm just gonna say corporation for time, if that has one member that provides 400 hours, then that payment limit doesn't change, then you still, that corp only receives $250,000 payment limit. If the corp has two members that, are, that have an ownership interest, and are providing 400 hours of active personal labor, active personal management or combination, then that corp would earn 500,000 and so on to the uh, 750,000 level for three persons in that corp. <clears throat> now our next slide, uh, there's a payment factor which Laura already touched on. And um, the initial payment will be factored down to 80 percent so the maximum really the maximum amount a person or legal entity is going to receive in their first payment is going to be two hundred thousand uh, dollars for a corp llc's and llp's qualifying for the optional increase that's going to be four hundred or six hundred thousand respectively and then like Laura said that those subsequent payments may be issued at a later date if determined by the secretary. <clears throat> so our next slide set is uh, those payments to persons and legal entities will be limited according to the rules of attribution. And that is what I was talking about earlier. We always say in the office that, or amongst our offices that payments always fall down to a warm body. So like a living person is how those payments are attributed. So when we, when we're uh, uh, dividing out all the payments and how the payment limitations work, it's going to always follow back to a Social Security number. And then those CFAP payments um, to legal entities, those are going to be tracked through four levels of ownership and will be reduced for members or partners holding an interest below that level. And one thing that I want everybody to remember too is that if you're if you're involved in multiple entities, like if you're if you receive payment as an individual, uh, you receive payment as a a partnership or in a, a corp, as as a person, you're only going to be able to earn two hundred fifty thousand dollars as a as a a warm living person, and um, so. Each entity that you're involved in, if you get to that much, it's going to, you might actually uh, lose out on a little bit of payment if, if, you, um, if you go over as an individual. Now, what I'd like to do uh, <clears throat> here is just discuss um, what the AGI requirements are. So what we're using for AGI is a program year 2020. And um, the adjusted gross income requirements for this program is that your AGI, when you average 2016, 17, and 18, if you're 900,000 or less, you're eligible, unless you have at least 75% of the AGI is derived from farming or ranching, you could earn over 900,000. Next slide. The CCC 941 is the form that we use to, um, to, to determine eligibility for the AGI. And then the CCC 942 is what we would use when a producer's AGI exceeds 900,000 and at least 75% of that producer's AGI is derived from farming, ranching, and forestry operations. So if you find yourself uh, where you may over, you may 
fall over the $900,000 payment limit, just remember that this the CCC 942 is an option that's available and that you, you can give the county office a call, tell them, tell them your situation and they'll be able to help you walk through this process. And then just want to define uh, just a, a quick definition of farm income as our handbook would, would define that. And that is that one thing that we want to remember is that the IC DISC dividend income that we may, that you see often with different individuals, that that is considered farm income for the CFAP program when the, the dividend is derived from farming and ranching. <clears throat> so my last slide here, what I'd like to to visit with you folks about is that um, conservation compliance does apply to this program. You know, we there's there's a lot of the a lot of our rules that we have don't apply, but in in this case, conservation compliance does apply. And so I just wanted to visit really quick about what conservation compliance is. And um, conservation compliance, it's a combination of rules to encourage good farming practices while maintaining the integrity of natural resources, mainly highly erodible lands and wetlands. And everyone, most everyone out there probably has, has filled out an AD 1026 in the past. And that, that's just our form in the FSA that we use to verify that a person where they certify on the on that form where they are they meet certain requirements and those are all laid out on that form and the county office will help you fill it out also on the CFAP application there's a certification in part a that would say that you meet those requirements as well now that completes my portion of this this presentation and I'm going to pass it along to Brian Haugen who's going to discuss non-specialty crops and wool. Thank you Ron. Uh, as Ron mentioned uh, my name is Brian Haugen. Um, Brian you accidentally muted yourself. Okay excuse me. Um, our portion that uh, we cover is going to be non-specialty crops along with wool. So that'll be the items that uh, we will be covering in the uh, next slide. So the- Brian, I'm not hearing you. <clears throat> oh, I, I am now, anybody else having issues? Okay, I'll continue. Can sound check, can people hear me now, Brian? Sounds good for me here. All right, all right. Let's, sorry, technical difficulties, let's move on. Okay. The next slide will identify as far as what are our eligible commodities and what is eligible under the CFAP program is for crop year 2019, it's a production program. Um, so in addition to 10 commodities, including two classes of wheat um, are eligible, uh, barley, it is specific to malting barley, and I'll address that uh, here forthcoming. Uh, the additional commodities on the next slide uh, indicate what are eligible for the CFAP program, uh, including the two classes of wheat that I referenced. In addition to specific to the commodity of wool, uh, you'll see that we have different uh, payment factors for both graded and non-graded wool. Uh, so both of those uh, would be eligible for the CFAP program. Our slide that we have displayed uh, next identifies of those 10 eligible commodities that we have for the CFAP program uh, regarding their intended use and eligibility for, for payment. Um, so as an example, uh, uh, corn uh, that's harvested as grain is eligible under the CFAP program and also corn silage uh, uh, raised for feed is going to be eligible and that's what's identified uh, in our intended uses. Along with uh, an example being the commodity of oats and uh, oats that's uh, 
in addition to being raised for grain, also for forage, um, is eligible as well. Uh, specific to the commodity of barley, um, uh, barley to be eligible under the CFAP program uh, needs to be uh, delivered and marketed as malting barley to, to qualify. On the next slide to illustrate uh, how, since our application process uh, pays in, in unit of measure for bushels, there'll be one entry for those commodities that uh, may be harvested as grain along with harvested uh, as hay or silage. Uh, specific to the commodity of corn, for example, you will be reporting one quantity uh, rate production from 2019 for the commodity of corn, which would include your grain corn and uh, your silage corn. So with that, we've included uh, here conversion factors, how you will be able to take your tonnage and convert uh, the tonnage of silage uh, to that of bushels. Likewise, on the next slide, we'll identify if you're eligible six commodities that we have listed there, uh, rather than taken for grain, they were taken for hay. Um, again, we're looking for one bushel entry under the CFAP program, so how you would be able to convert your tonnage um, of hay uh, to that of, of actual grain bushels. So let's get into the specifics um, as far as what you are to provide FSA when applying for the CFAP program. And, uh, Laura had went through and identified the application being the AD3114. Um, when it comes, and it's a two page uh, document, and I'm going to be discussing specific to Part D that deals with our non specialty crops along with wool. Uh, in item number 13, the very first entry there, as mentioned, we have our uh, 10 commodities uh, that were shown in slides. Uh, 32 and 33, along with um, the two classes of wheat, uh, along with wool, specific to both graded um, and non-graded wool. Item 14, uh, the next entry is the unit uh, of measure. Um, all of the eligible CFAP commodities, the unit of measure is going to be bushels. Therefore, as referenced, you have conversion factors for commodities harvested as silage or hay to convert those to bushels. With the exception of canola, sunflowers, um, and wool, uh, those would be, re uh, your unit of measure uh, would be pounds. Item 15 uh, on, in Part D is your, of the eligible CFAP commodities, uh, is going to be your certification of your total production. Uh, again, it's a production program. So what was your total production in 2019 for that CFAP commodity. And more specifically on total production, I do wanna mention, as Laura said, it's one application. So that is your total production. So if you have farming interest in more than one county, it would be your share of that CFAP commodity. Your total production would be entered uh, in item number 15. Item number 16, is uh, an entry as far as looking at what did we you have in inventory that was not sold as of uh, January 15th. The next slide further expounds on this entry for item 16 uh, when we reference to uh, not sold. Uh, it's quantities that uh, you have ownership of um, that were subject to uh, price risk as of uh, January um, 15th. So it was not subject to any agreed upon um, contract, such as a forward contract or agreement or a binding contract um, that would then, you know, make the quantity um, ineligible. So what are some of the contracts as it would relate to eligibility and there being price risk? Uh, USDA has identified um, and there, we have six or five contracts here listed on the slide that are identified that if they were in existence as of January 15th, uh, you would have price risk and that quantity would be eligible. Uh, that was under contract the 15th of January prior for the uh, CFAP program. Furthermore, the USDA has identified uh, specific contracts that if they were in place, um, on or before January 15th, um, they would not be eligible for the CFAP program 
because the commodity was not at price risk. So how would uh, that be identified um, in item 16 and likewise in, in item 15 for that matter is let's say in crop year 2019, a producer raised 6,500 bushels uh, of a commodity and that was still an in inventory uh, on January 15th. Um, however, 5,000 of those bushels had been contracted under a, a forward a price contract. Um, based on the contracts that we just went through, uh, that would result in what remaining quantity of that 6,500 bushels is at price risk. And the answer to that would be 1,500 bushels. Uh, 5,000 had been contracted, 1,500 were not covered by contract, they're subject to price risk, and that would be our entry then that we would have uh, you reporting in item 16. As far as the payments, uh, and again, from the onset to this presentation, it was identified that there are two funding sources for um, the CFAP program. So the next slide that we identify as far as a list of some of the commodities that we've already touched on and their eligibility, what the funding level is under the CARES Act, in addition to the funding level under uh, CCC. And we'll show you how um, eligible payments are computed using those two different funding sources based on your uh, eligible quantity. And the slide that we have displayed here now just references the remaining quantities that we talked about and also uh, further breaking down our two classes of wheat that are eligible in addition to separate payment rates for um, wool that is graded along with non-graded wool. So as far as those different payment rates under the CARES Act or CCC, how is part one uh, going to be paid? And the, the payment rate under, under part one is going to be uh, what's in block 16, your quantity that was subject to price risk as of January 15th, not to exceed uh, your total 2019 total production that would have been in block 50. So of that eligible quantity, 50% uh, of your eligible CFAP quantity will be paid using the payment rate uh, under the uh, CARES Act. And then the next slide will identify the same calculation uh, under the CCC Charter Act in regards to your other remaining 50% that is eligible will be paid using the CCC payment rate uh, for that eligible quantity. And then what you will receive, even though the, the mechanics of it, your eligible quantity being calculated by two different factors, half of the production under CARES, half under the CCC charter, uh, there will be one payment uh, that would be issued. So let's put uh, an example in play here in regards to uh, you know, what we've went through in regards to uh, your certification on the application uh, form. Uh, using the commodity of soybeans. And as mentioned uh, in our earlier example, uh, we referenced to producers uh, total 2019 production being the 6,500 bushels. Uh, again, uh, to, to be clear that in, in box 15, that is the total production raised in all counties uh, of that commodity. Uh, likewise, commodities that uh, uh, you know, corn, where we have grain corn, silage corn, it's one entry, all converted to bushels. Uh, in this example, a producer that has 6,500 uh, bushels total production in 2019. And in our example previously, even though uh, the producer still had that into January, 5,000 bushels were under forward contract uh, that were not subject to price loss. So the uh, quantity that was subject is the 1,500. Uh, that would be the quantity then entered in box 16. So using the formula that we just looked at previously and using the rates, how is payment computed uh, in that instance? Um, the quantity subject to um, price loss, uh, block 16 was our 1500 bushels. Um, the, the producer in this example had a total inventory in 2019 or total production in 2019 of 6,500 bushels. That's what was entered in uh, item 15. However, uh, it's not to exceed 50% of your total production. So that's why we have 30, uh, 3,250 bushels 
Uh, so the payment would be not to exceed 50%. In this instance, it would be the 1,500 bushels uh, is your eligible payment amount. And as referenced, due to the two parts in funding, uh, that 1,500 bushels is split. Uh, it, there would be you know, 750 bushels paid under the CARES Act and the other 750 bushels uh, paid under the CCC funds. So a total payment in that example for the 1,500 bushels would be the uh, $712. Uh, dollars. The last slide in which uh, I wanted to identify uh, with you in regards to the completion of the application, as mentioned, the CFAP program uh, is a certification, certification to your total 2019 production of those eligible commodities, along with your certification of um, what quantity was subject to price risk as of January 15th. Uh, we're not going to be asking at the time of application for contracts that you have or asking for production records to be submitted uh, at the time of application. Um, that may, you know, obviously come later under uh, spot check compliance oversight uh, later on. Uh, but right now at the time of application, it's your certification to the form and uh, our local county committees uh, are going to be reviewing the apps. And uh, if they have some questions as far as eligibility, they may be asking for some additional documentation, whether to verify uh, ownership of a quantity uh, or an ownership interest in the commodity itself uh, before they would approve the application for payment. So that concludes uh, the presentation on non-specialty crops and wool. Uh, I would now like to turn it over to Jay Hohalter, who will be discussing dairy. Thank you, Brian. As Brian mentioned, my name is Jay Hohalter. I work in the Livestock and Conservation Division here in the State Office in Fargo. And today I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to join us. As I mentioned, uh, I, I will start providing, with providing an overview of the dairy and livestock portion of this program. And hopefully this overview will provide you with some information to help in assembling your records and identifying what you need to do to complete an application. So starting with the dairy program, uh, we'll discuss what an eligible dairy operation is. And, and it's quite simply a dairy operation is any operation that produced milk for the following months. Uh, to be eligible under CFAP, it would have been producing milk in January, February, or March of 2020. And it would also include any dairy operations that might have dissolved during those months. Any milk produced from a dissolved dairy during January, February, or March would also be considered eligible for the program. So what is milk, eligible milk production? Looking at this next slide, it's, it pretty much follows along with an eligible dairy. We're going to, eligible milk would be milk produced for the months of January, February, and March of 2020. It would also include, again, any dump milk that had to be dumped during January through March. Uh, and along with that, any dairy that has production covered under the, any of the various market protection programs, such as our DMC program or the Dairy Revenue Protection Program, uh, does not exclude you from eligibility for CFAP. Moving on to the next slide. Producers are gonna use the following information to help them certify to their milk production for January through March of 2020. One of the easiest things to do, probably in most cases, would be to use your milk marketing statements for the months of January through March. As far as for records of dump milk, that may be a little more difficult. Uh, if you've got some idea of, of bulk tank measurements prior to dumping or some other type of record that can show the amount of milk that was dumped during those three, three months, uh, again, you can use that to help record your production. And again, as mentioned by the other presenters, all of the production is one entry for each month. So if you have actual production that was sold during January, February, March, as well as dump milk, you would combine the two for that month and make one entry on your application. Again, as mentioned prior, we are not going to take or accept the documents that you use to do the certification. 
You should keep those again, like was mentioned, for up to three years in case your application would be subject to spot check. We need to spend a minute or two talking about various types of organizations in a dairy. Uh, again, as mentioned by prior presenters, our applications are based on ID number. So if you have a husband and wife joint venture without a employer tax identification number, then each member of that joint venture would apply separately for CFAP. And, and as far as the application itself, you would need to break down your percentage of milk production and list it on your application. So if you share 50-50 in the dairy operation, you would record 50% of the total production on your application, and the other partner would record 50% of the production on their application. Okay, taking a look at the application itself for dairy, it's uh, pretty straightforward, very few entries required. And I'd like to mention on all of these applications, you see the sections for the applicable commodity or livestock, you'll see a header shaded in black and a header shaded in gray. Uh, the header shaded in black is information that applicants will enter. The header area shaded in gray that's identified for county committee use only would be used by the county committee if for some reason they determined there needed to be an adjust adjustment to the claimed uh, production listed on your application. Again, as we've other presenters have mentioned, the milk portion or dairy portion of the CFAP program is again broken down into two parts for funding. We have part one, which will take your total production in pounds. And again, remember when you're entering your information on the application to enter it in pounds, not in hundred weight. So we'll take your production in total pounds and multiply it by the, the factor of 4.7 cents per pound under the CARES Act. And then for the CCC part two, we would take your production in pounds and multiply it times an adjustment factor of 1.014 and then times the price of 1.47 cents per pound. Okay, so from there, that's a quick overview of the dairy uh, portion of the program. Now we'll move on into the livestock portion of CFAP. And initially I wanna mention there are two significant parts to the livestock program. There are two components to look at. There's the eligible livestock producer, what makes up an eligible livestock producer, and then what, el what livestock have been determined by USDA to be eligible for this program. Um, moving on to the next slide, this is an overview and I'm not gonna read it to you, but it provides the definition of an eligible producer as well as information on contract growers that would be considered eligible. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, there's kind of a summary that I will highlight. Livestock owners and contract growers basically who are at risk and have a share of the livestock available for marketing or would have had a share had the livestock been marketed are eligible, considered eligible livestock producers. Now let's take a look at the livestock eligibility uh, on the next page. We've received several questions over a period of time about this part of the program. So I'll take a little bit of time to try and discuss this. When the livestock portion was set up, the department looked at livestock, what types and categories of livestock realized at least a 5% or greater national market price decline between the average price for the week of January 13th to the 17th relative to the average price for the week of April 6th to April 10th. So in other words, uh, 
we're going to take a look. The, the department took a look at the average price for the five days in January, compared that to the average price for the five days listed in April. And if that price decreased by 5% or greater from January to April, then that category of livestock has been determined eligible for CFAP. And as was discussed in the opening of, of the program, there was a new term out there that was said that the commodity or livestock must have been subject to price risk. And for livestock, they needed to be subject to price risk as of January 15th. And again, we're providing assistance to producers who had commodities, livestock that were subject to price risk, and that price was impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak. We've had a lot of questions regarding different types of contracts and agreements that were in place prior to January 15th, and whether the livestock would be eligible based on that agreement. And in simplest of terms, what would that uh, uh, agreement stipulate in terms of your price? Did the, the agreement or the contract guarantee you a certain price that was not or would not be impacted by price decline? If that's the case, then their livestock were not subject to price risk. Okay, the next slide identifies the eligible categories of livestock that were identified to have had a price decrease of at least 5% over the period of time that we talked about. Definitions for each of these categories, I'll cover that here in a couple of slides later um, again, but these are the ones that the agency was able to support had at least a 5% decline in the price from January to April. So what are the definitions of some of those categories? Again, if we're looking at feeder cattle that are less than 600 pounds, simply looking at cattle weighing less than 600 pounds. And similarly, for over for 600 pounds or more, we're going to look at cattle uh, that weighed at least 600 pounds uh, during that period of time, but were less than the slaughter weight definition that we will discuss on the next slide. Okay. For slaughter cattle, fed cattle, it really identifies cattle that had an average weight in excess of 1,400 pounds with an average carcass weight in excess of 800 pounds that were intended for slaughter. But if you look at the definition in the federal regulation, it, the 1,400 pounds came from an average of 1,200 to 1,600 pounds of slaughter weight. So in essence, if, they're, if fed cattle have fall into the range between 12, between 12 and 1,600 pounds, they would be eligible to be included under this category. So it's not 1,400 pounds or more. If your livestock fall into the range of at least 1,200 pounds up to 1,600 pounds at a slaughter weight, they should be included under this category. Additional categories, we've got slaughter cattle that are mature cattle, meaning these are the ones that were culled uh, that had been maintained for breeding purposes, purposes, but were removed from inventory and intended for slaughter. And this would include such things as your gummers, your open cows, cows sold that were culled after losing their calf, et cetera. That would be the slaughter cattle for mature cattle. The all other category, all other cattle category means commercially raised or maintained bovine animals not meeting any of the other categories. And this rule, but this rule excludes beefalo, bison, and animals used for dairy production or intended for dairy production. So this category, the all other cattle category, would include your breeding stock. The stock that aren't intended for slaughter, it would include your bulls, cows, bred heifers, et cetera. Okay, moving on to the next slide. we have the definition for uh, pigs, hogs, and sheep. So basically under swine, we have two categories. Pigs would mean any swine that were weighing less than 1,200 pounds or 120 pounds, and hogs would mean any swine 120 pounds or more. And for sheep, we have one category and that would be lambs and yearlings, meaning all sheep less than two years of age. So under the lambs and 
the sheep. There is no weight requirement. It simply has an age requirement of less than two years of age. Further diving into the eligible livestock category again, livestock need to be owned by the applicant on January 15th and then sold between January 15th and April 15th of 2020 to be considered for part one of the CFAP program. And part one, again, we identified as being the period of time from January 15th through April 15th. And that part one specifically deals with livestock that were sold during that period of time. Along with that, you can have offspring that were born from that inventory that were born after January 15th and then subsequently sold prior to April 15th. So if you have uh, a livestock herd of and run a cow-calf operation and you had cows that calved on February 1st, and for whatever reason, those baby calves got sold on April 1st, they could be included under part one of the application even though they were not in inventory as of January 15th. The second part of the CFAP application uh, deals with livestock that were in inventory and owned between April 16th and May 14th. And again, that would be for livestock that were at price risk during that period of time. Another eligible class, we talked about dairy cattle that are uh, intended for dairy production are not eligible, but any of those dairy cattle that are no longer used for producing milk and have entered the beef cattle market as slaughter animals would be included under the livestock portion of the CFAP program. And again, just as a note, we've talked about this several times, but all sales and inventory of livestock must be subject to price risk as of January 15th of 2020. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Ineligible livestock would include the following. We have livestock, again, as we mentioned, that are used for dairy production or intended for dairy production. So if you're in the, the business of raising uh, dairy heifers to sell to a dairy to go into the herd for production or producing milk, those, again, would not be eligible for the CFAP program. Livestock purchased after January 15th and then sold on or before the 15th of 2020 would not be eligible. So in other words, for part one, they had to be in inventory as of January 15th and be at price risk unless they were the offspring of that inventory. Livestock, and we've talked about this, or I've talked about this on several occasions, if there was an agreed upon price in, a, in such type of contract that basically guaranteed a set price that eliminated market risk from those livestock, if that was in place prior to uh, January 15th, the, the livestock covered by that agreement would not be considered eligible for the program. As far as the dairy cattle that are no longer used in the dairy and are sold into the beef cattle market, there are two categories. We would have the dairy cull cows that would go in under the slaughter cattle, mature cattle category, and any dairy calves such as your bull calves, et cetera, that are then sold to a feedlot or a feeder would go into the feeder calves greater or less than 600 pounds, depending upon the category. Okay, moving on to the next slide. What kind of information is required from, the, from you as a producer to participate in the CFAP program? Again, it's going to be a self-certification program uh, that is done by the livestock producer or their authorized representative. Okay, following uh, the sales and inventory information is it, it, the following information is what's required for sales and inventory from the livestock producer as applicable. And under part one, and I guess my slide isn't showing the, the oh, there we go. 
under part one of the CFAP livestock application, we're asking you for the owned inventory of eligible livestock as of January 15th and any offspring from that inventory that were subject to price risk again and then subsequently sold on the market between January 15th and April 15th. So again, part one of your application strictly deals with livestock, eligible livestock that were sold during that period of time. Part two of the application is your highest owned inventory that is subject to price risk between the dates of April 16th and May 14th. Now for part two, those livestock do not have to have been owned as of January 15th. In other words, this could cover livestock that you purchased on April 17th or May 1st, and as long as they were still subject to price risk, could be considered eligible. And I've identified on this slide that under part one, the entry for each of those would go on item 21 on your application. And for part two, they would go into item number 22. And we will take a look at that application uh, here shortly. We'll go on to the next slide. This is the livestock information portion that we will be asking the producers to complete. And under the livestock section, you're going to enter one of those categories that I covered previously in the presentation. And as will be demonstrated later on using the front facing uh, Excel spreadsheet tool to help you, when you click on the box, the drop down will appear, a drop down box will appear with the various eligible categories, and you can pick that category to enter in item 19. Again, for livestock, the unit of measure will be per head. And then in item 21, you're seeing where we've got the, again, uh, information for those that were sold during the period January to April. And in item 22, we're looking at the highest number of in inventory that were still at price risk between April 16th and May 14th. Again, the columns beyond that to the right are saved for county committee adjustments. As other presenters have mentioned, we have two separate sources of funding for this program, and that's the reason that the uh, program is divided into what I've referenced as part one, which covers the CARES Act funding, and part two comes into play with the CCC funding. Again, we're gonna, in a minute, we will take a look at the various classes and the payment rates uh, for each of these two parts. And here's the slide that discusses that. Um, you'll notice again that we have different payment rates to, for each of the different categories. However, you will notice over on the CCC uh, part two payment rate for cattle, the payment rate is the same for all categories. Uh, for hogs and pigs, the payment rate is the same for all categories. So, Producers have asked, well, why do I need to identify which category my livestock, uh, how many I had in each category, if the payment rate is all the same? And again, that comes back to the integrity of the program. And if you are selected uh, as one of the operations to be spot checked, we want to be able to verify uh, the number of head that you had in each of the applicable categories. And Again, if we spot check you, we're not going to get down to was this calf uh, at 601 or 599, but we would look more towards the, if you claimed you had X number of head between those two categories, is there evidence to support your application that you have that many uh, livestock under those two categories or the total of the two categories equals what you claimed. Now I'm going to run through uh, an example real quickly of an uh, entity that uh, is applying for the program and their inventory as of January 15th of 2020 was 490 bred cows, 15 herd bulls and 50 replacements. All of these were subject to market risk 
in this example. That's an assumption that's being made that all were subject to price risk. Okay, for the sales for part one of the program, between January 15th and April 15th, the entity certified that they sold 10 cull cows and seven baby calves that were born after January 15th. For the second part on the inventory portion, they certified to their highest inventory on a given day that were subject to price risk between April 16th and May 14th. And they certified that there were 480 cow calf pairs, 18 herd bulls, and 75 replacements. So going over to the application section, again, we've entered under the sales portion in column 21, we've entered the seven baby calves that were sold. They are under the feeder cattle less than 600 pound category. They entered the 10 cull cows that were sold under the slaughter cattle, mature cattle category. For the inventory entries in item 22, Again, we mentioned that they had 480 baby calves, so they are entered again under the feeder cattle less than 600 pounds. And under the all other category for cattle, there's 573. And, that, and if you click on the slide here, I think it'll pop in and explain what was entered into that. Okay, so it shows we had the 480 cows, the 18 bulls, and the 75 heifers. And again, remember that we're making one entry, so you have to combine all of those that would fit into that all other category. And in this example, the producer started with 15 bulls in January, but by the time we got to April, had added an additional three bulls to his herd, as well as picked up another 25 replacement heifers. So that's where we come up with the difference between the beginning inventory and the inventory that he certified to on that day. Another reminder, when you're doing this inventory certification, it's the highest number of all classes on a given day. You cannot certify to a particular class on one day and another class on a different day. It has to be on one given day, what was your highest inventory across all classes of livestock? Now this completes the livestock section uh, of the webinar, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things before I turn it back to Laura. On our farmers.gov website, it has some interfacing information and will provide the location of the tool that will be demonstrated later to help you complete your application. Also found on the CFAP portion of that farmers.gov website, there is a notice of funding availability posted there. And what that's allowing producers to do is provide comment to USDA through June 22nd regarding the CFAP program and why you believe there should be additional commodities or livestock added to the program, or if you believe there are circumstances that weren't considered, considered for uh, livestock and commodities that are already included. And I'll give you an example. I had a producer call me and express his concern about the fact that he held his feeder calves until the end of April, trying to hope the market would come back. That producer wound up selling his feeder calves for the same price that he could have gotten in February. And if he had sold them in February, his price would have been much different than the inventory price from May or from April to May. And he had all of the documents, he had done his research on the markets, the futures, et cetera. So he was going to go put all of that information into the NOFA requirements for consideration for changing or adding some funding to the inventory class of the livestock portion. There's also another document there on that page that is a very interesting document that analyzes the price and costs and how the department determined which commodities and livestock had suffered the 5% decline in price as we talked about. So it's a, a good reference document that you may wanna take a look at if you feel like things aren't uh, reflecting what the market 
actually transpired over the period of time covered by this program. So with that, I thank you, and I will turn it back over to Laura to discuss some specialty crop issues. Thanks, Jay. Um, so I'll be covering value loss crops and specialty crops. Um, at this time, there are no value loss crops that are eligible. And as Jay just mentioned, um, that notice of funding availability um, document that producers can provide uh, comments to in regards to additional crops that should be eligible. Um, they are waiting for um, the conclusion of that comment period to determine which value loss crops will be eligible. In regards to specialty crops, this is a listing of specialty crops that are eligible at this time. Um, you'll notice that when you look through the different crops, all of the crops listed there are for fresh or processed. We've had a lot of questions on whether dry edible beans or pulse crops are eligible. At this time, they are not. But as Jay stated, if you feel like they should be, you can go ahead um, and make a comment and give your reasoning as to why they should be included um, as to comment on that notice of funding available. And we'll give you the website of where you can get that information. With specialty crops, there's three different categories. Um, there's volume of production sold between January 15th and April 15th, volume of production shipped but not sold and unpaid, and acres with production not shipped or sold. And this is all completed in Part G of the application. So for the sold portion in item 32, this is going to be the value, volume or pounds of production subject to price risk sold between January 15th and April 15th of the eligible specialty crops. Item 33 is where you'll enter any delivered and unpaid um, production. So it'd be the volume of production subject to price risk shipped but not sold or unpaid between January 15th and April 15th of 2020. And then the last um, category is you'll enter into item 34 is the number of acres with production subject to price risk that was not shipped or sold between January 15th and April 15th. We'll calculate payments for specialty crops by taking that volume um, in each particular category times the payment rate for each of the three different categories. Um, in regards to not delivered, when we take the acres times the payment rate, that payment rate was based on the national average yield per acre times the per pound payment rate. With that, that was a brief um, overview of what was included um, in the program for specialty crops. Um, as I said, uh, this is just a slide saying that we encourage you to uh, sign up for Gov Delivery, which is how we provide information through emails and text messages to our producers. So please, if you haven't already done so, um, sign up for that. And this is a, a slide indicating where all of our service centers are located throughout North Dakota. Um, our county offices are not open to the public at this time, but they are taking um, appointments and questions um, through either email or um, by phone. So you may not be able to go in for an appointment by phone or by in person, but you can contact your local county office and they can answer any of the questions that you may have um, over the phone and they can help you complete an application and mail that out to you that you could complete, complete that you could sign and send back to the county office for payment. The next few slides um, give you for each county office in North Dakota gives you a group email address that you can use to contact your local county office. Um, this will send an email to every county or every employee in the county office. And then there's also the phone number there to contact your local office. This is um, additional communication resources. Uh, the website that uh, Jay referred to was www.farmers.gov/cfap. 
This is where you're going to find information on the calculator that Ron Haugen will go through and then also how you can provide a comment to that notice of funding availability if you feel that another um, program should be con or another commodity should be um, considered for the program. And also if you want any information on um, the coronavirus and how it's affecting our service centers, there's a, a link there that you can, can access that information. Uh, this slide just gives all of our contact information for those of us who have presented um, throughout this uh, coronavirus um, webinar. And now I think we're going to, we'll leave questions, I think, until after Ron is presented. Is that correct, Brian? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? This is Ron. Yeah, I can hear you, Ron. Okay, so Brian will be advancing. I still don't have any electricity, but my batteries are holding up on my computer and my phone here. So Brian will will be it will be uh, moving around on the spreadsheet uh, as I talk, and hopefully we can get through this okay. Uh, a few th items I wanted to mention: uh, FSA, a very good job with the slides that you went through. Very informative. And I really like this calculator. Uh, it's something that I hadn't seen before from, from FSA. Very good. Um, a few comments about the calculator. You, uh, as was mentioned, you go on to the website, uh, farmers.gov slash CFAP, and download the calculator. For those that aren't real computer, computer savvy, um, this is a, it, it's, it's a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, and it's in an older version of Excel because not everybody has the newest version. Uh, and then it also has macros in it. Uh, so you can click on boxes to move around fairly simply. Uh, there really is only two sheets you really are, should be concerned about is the data entry, the first sheet, and then you can go to the, the, uh, the, the uh, estimated payment sheet uh, to see actually how things are calculated. When you do download this, um, it'll ask you to enable uh, for editing, uh, which you need to do, and it will also ask you to enable macros. Some of you may have some various forms of security on your computer, um, and you may have to even change your security to allow you to enable macros, uh, but that gets a little more technical. Hopefully, it will work, but you need to do those things to make it work. So uh, we're looking here at the first page. Um, and Brian, you can just move the cursor around as I talk and kind of figure out where I'm going to be here. But on the top where you enter your, the state, uh, and North Dakota, of course, and your county, the control county, you simply just enter your name and address and, uh, and, your, uh, and, your, and your zip code there. And as we scroll down, I'll just, I, what, I don't know, before we scroll down, I want you to look at that red number there that says 79,811. This is a, I just came up with this sample, so I put all the very, uh, various um, uh, commodities in one file just for illustration purposes. One farm would not have hogs and sheep and pigs and, and every, every type of commodity. Uh, so this number doesn't really mean anything other than that's just what it's, it totals up to be. Uh, when you enter your own farm in, in there, that's, that's, uh, that's the bottom line there. That's the 80% that you would, would receive. So as we scroll down, Brian, um, we're going to look at dairy first because that's the first one on the list. We scroll down a little bit and get to the dairy entry. And uh, you can see there that um, it's asking for pounds of production. And as the presenters went over, over that, um, I just had a simple example. Just let's say we had a hundred cow herd and, and we had 20, uh, 20 hundred weight per uh, of milk produced per cow per month, and it's asking for the first quarter. So you enter it, let's just say it's equal for January, February, and March, 200,000 pounds of milk. And as we mentioned before, we have the various payments. So from that, the CARES payment would be 22,608, and the CCC payment would be 7,154. 7, now, if you, and you, you say, well, how is that calculated? So if you scroll up, and, and click on that button, uh, on the orange button that says go to estimated payment. And then you can actually go down and look at the dairy and see how it's actually calculated. 
Um, you can see there the, the, the various months, uh, January, February, and March. And, um, and, and then, so the total is 600,000 pounds of milk times that factor of 4.71 cents. That's where you get the 22,000. And then for the, for the, other, the other payment, you use that 600,000 and you multiply it by that uh, adjustment factor 1.014 uh, and then you and then on that amount you get 1.47 cents that's where you get that 7000 those two added together are what you what you get now click back where it says go to data entry that blue box and that will go back here and then I'm going to get down here to the non specialty crops part 2 and I just had a sample uh, example farm here. Let's just say a, a typical North Dakota farm, let's just say 2,500 acres, 500 acres of corn, 1,000 acres of soybeans, 1,000 acres of spring wheat. And you can see there uh, you can, uh, uh, that you, you would enter in your, uh, your 2019 total production. And, there, and it's, it's just a matter of entering that, those numbers in. And, um, and also you need to enter your inventory uh, as of January 15th, 2020, okay? And the rule is you take the smaller of 50% of your production or your inventory on that date. So based on those numbers for corn, for example, you're gonna get a payment of $10,720. And you may wonder, well, let's see how that's calculated. Scroll back up, click to the, uh, click to the box that says estimated payments and then scroll down again and look at corn. And you can see there that uh, um, corn, uh, 80,000 80, bushels, um, production not yet sold, not yet priced, 50,000 uh, bushels. You enter the smaller, so that's the smaller of, uh, of column E, uh, or 50% of column, smaller column E or column F, 50% of E is, uh, is 40,000 and that is smaller than that column F of, of, of uh, 50,000. Uh, now, uh, the way these factors work, the CARES payment, uh, payment is 50% of that 40,000. So 20,000 times that CARES rate of 32 cents, 51.20. And then uh, for the, uh, the uh, CCC payment, 50% of that 40,000 is 20,000. And then times that, uh, times that 35 cents, you get 5,600, those two added together. Um, that's the simple, simple way, uh, uh, a very transparent on how that's calculated. So let's go back up to the data entry again and look at those crops. Now I wanna talk about uh, uh, soybeans a little bit here. Um, the, uh, I, I just put an example in here that you, you produced uh, 40,000 pounds of soybeans and um, 10,000, uh, 10, uh, 40,000 bushels of soybeans, 10,000 uh, bushels were, were, uh, were, were um, uh, not sold at this time, not priced, and the payment for the soybeans would total 3,800. Let's go down and go click to the estimated payment again, and you can see how that's calculated. It takes that, uh, that, um, that uh, uh, 10,000, because uh, that's the lower of uh, the inventory or half of the production, 10,000. 50% of that is 5,000 times 45 cents, 1,800. And then uh, and and, and, uh, for the CCC payment, 50% of that, 5,000 bushels times 50 cents, um, 2,000. Uh, mathematically, uh, you've seen some charts that some, uh, some uh, analysts have put out Basically, you're, you're taking these two payments and taking a simple average of those, the weighted the average is what your payment would be because it's, it's 50%. Um, I, and then I'm gonna, I'll just stay here just, for, just because of time and uh, I'll, let's look at the wheat. And let's just pretend then that this person harvested 60,000 bushels of wheat and they sold it all before um, uh, January 15th okay so your inventory or uh, your inventory on that day uh, was zero at, okay so you enter the smaller of the inventory or 50% of your production you get zero 
and you follow it all through, you are going to get zero payment for wheat. And you may say, well, hey, that's not fair. Why do I get nothing for wheat? Well, you've already sold your production before that magical date of, 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 of uh, January 15th. And the market was quite a bit higher at that point, uh, and it started dipping after that. So really, you are much better off if you did sell your crop for, in most instances, um, if you did sell your crop before that date, you, you, and you got your money from the market rather than from the government. Um, because uh, if, if you didn't sell your crop and are holding it, and the price was going down, now you, the, the, the government is trying to help you out but it's only at this point 50% of your production what you're getting paid on. So, so there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of people complaining about that. If we don't have any inventory, we aren't going to get any money. Well, the reason you have any, don't have any inventory is you, is you probably sold it at a better price than people that, people that held it. Okay, so that pretty much covers it for the crops. And let's go back to the data entry sheet again. And then for the livestock on part three, this is where you can actually pick your various livestock. You, you, you put your cursor in there and there's a drop down menu. Um, and, uh, and, and, that, and, and I have it, I, I just picked, uh, I just pretended to have a, a, a 200 cow herd here uh, and then that you sell feeder cattle. And uh, I picked those, I picked this ver these various uh, livestock uh, uh, here. So let's just assume that we sold 130 head, the, the feeder cattle that weighed over 600 pounds. And, and as was mentioned before on the slides, on the FSA slides, you take your highest inventory between on a particular day, uh, pick that day, and that's your inventory for your various classes there, okay, for the cattle. Okay, so on that date then, whatever that highest inventory day was, Let's say you had still had 20 head to sell, and you can see you would get a payment there. The CARES payment plus the CCC payment would be 14,984. And remember that is adjusted to that 80%. Yeah, and I think I'll just stay right here, uh, just in the instance of, for the instance of time. Let's just assume that you sold some more feeder, feeder cattle that didn't weigh as much. And uh, let's say they weighed less than 600 pounds. Let's say you sold 40 of those uh, during that sales period between January 15th and April 15th. Let's say you sold 40 of them and your highest inventory was 10. You get a payment of 35.28 for that. And let's say you are culling some older, older cows, uh, some mature cattle, and let's say you, you sold 30 head from your herd and you're gonna be, try to replace those and at that time, you still have 170 head in your inventory, okay? So let's go and click on the, go back to the estimated payment one, and then you can see how everything is all laid out for the livestock. Notice there that the, um, the, the feeder cattle, 130 head, uh, the chart that was presented, um, you, you don't have to know that number, the, the, this uh, calculator automatically uh, picks that out, and uh, and it's $139 a head times 30, 130 head uh, times 80% is 14456 and then your inventory number of 20 times $33 a head, uh, you get uh, 528 For those lighter, lighter feeder cattle, 40 head uh, at 102 times 80%, and it, it, your inventory of 10 times 33 times 80%. For the slaughter cattle then, 30 head, and the rate for the slaughter cattle sold during April, uh, January 15th, April 15th, 92, and then your inventory, $33 a head there. Okay, that takes care of the, lot of the, of the beef cattle. Then let's go back to the data entry. Now remember now the only place you can enter things are on this first sheet and there's a drop down arrow uh, that you can pick or whatever, uh, whatever type of livestock that you're looking at. Now for purposes of this program, pigs are considered less than 120 pounds. So for example, I just picked 100 head of, 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 of pigs less than 120 pounds. 
uh, that were sold. And, and I just picked 50 as the inventory on the highest point. And with that, the payment shows $2,920. Hogs are considered 120 pounds or more. So let's, I just assume we're gonna sell 100 of those for, for illustration purposes, and that we have 50 in the inventory uh, uh, at the highest inventory po point between that date of April 16th to May 14th. And then you can see your payment there. It's, um, it's uh, all totaled together. And then of course, that's the 80%. Um, I will get it, I might as well uh, talk about the lambs and yearlings here too. Um, if you have land, if you have sheep that's old, that's older than two years of age, there is no payment on that. Uh, not that it couldn't be changed later, as Laura talked about, but at this point, they're only paying for for lambs and yearlings less than two years of age. Um, it, uh, so you enter in. Let's say you had a hundred head and you had fifty in inventory, um, and uh, and then based on the rate, you get twenty nine twenty on that. Let's go back to the calculation page of the estimated payment. Click on that orange bar, orange block, and you can go down here. I'll talk about the pigs here. Um, the, the 100 head, the rate was 28. Uh, and then for the inventory, the rate was 17. Um, and then 80% of those numbers, it's just a straightforward calculation. Okay. And um, for, the, for the hogs, a hundred uh, over 120 pounds. Uh, the rate is 18. So 100 times 18 times 80% is 1440. Uh, for the highest inventory, 50 times 17 times 80% 680. Uh, all those those numbers added together are your payment for your for your pigs and hogs. And and now for the lambs, uh, $33 a head uh, for the sales. Um, that gets to be at times 80%, 2640. Uh, and if you had some inventory, then it would be $7 a head for $280. So it's a very straightforward, simple worksheet to, to put in your numbers. Um, I think it's, they've done a very good job of, of putting this together. So let's go back, back to the data entry. And um, I'm going to cover the last thing I'm going to cover here, this, uh, my technical difficulty both these kind of threw me for a loop here, but I'll see if I can get through it here. I, uh, for part five on the specialty crops, uh, North Dakota doesn't have a lot of specialty crops like vegetables, but I know there is some people that grow carrots and I just pick carrots just to show you an example. And then you always got to be concerned about when you pick your, when you pick your, uh, uh, a vegetable, uh, your specialty crop there, there's a drop down arrow. Uh, and, and it'll it, and you can pick from a, a whole variety of, of specialty crops and make sure you make sure you uh, uh, whatever pounds of a unit of measure is used make sure you're entering your information accordingly so there's actually three payments that can be made for carrots some vegetables there's only two payments uh, but you don't have to worry about that the, this spreadsheet sorts sorts it all out for I didn't really know what the yield and carrots were for North Dakota but I just put in I'm just assuming that somebody's going to grow two acres of carrots, and um, and we have uh, let's say 30,000 pounds produced, a production that was sold between January 15th and April 15th, okay, and then also the volume of production that was shipped, but not sold. You shipped it out, but it hasn't been priced yet. I'll just say 10,000 pounds, and then there's a third payment for vegetables. And then you enter that in, in acres, not pounds. So it, it may throw you for a loop there. Um, so I just put in one acre. I'll just say that one acre, we had production that was shipped. Uh, and it was, not, it was not shipped or it was not sold. It might have been destroyed. I don't know. But I'll just put one acre in there. And then if you follow it over, um, you can see you, you get um, uh, $480 for the first CARES payment. And, and 880 for the second CARES payment. And then uh, uh, the CCC payment would be one would be uh, $1,001 and all that added together for the carrot enterprise is 2361. That's 80% of course. Okay, let's go to up again and get to the get to the uh, the um, uh, estimated payment page again. Okay, 
and let's go down to the carrots and I'll, and I'll show you how this is done. The carrots are just in the unit of measure, of course, is pounds. And we had 30,000 pounds. And now for the quantity on, on, on the carrots, we can use 100%. Uh, so then that's, uh, so we get 30,000 pounds that we can calculate on. And the CARES payment rate is two cents a pound. Now, when this program was first rolled out, there was a typo. They had 20 cents a pound for carrots, but it, it has been so cor corrected, okay? So it's two cents a pound. And uh, the CARES, uh, the, the CARES gross payment then would be $480. And then, um, uh, the, uh, then the, the second CARES payment, the 10,000 uh, pounds of production that was shipped but not sold, 10,000 pounds. There the CARES payment is 11 cents. So 10,000 times 11 cents times 80% then is $880. Scrolling down to the last table there for carrots, um, and this is, the, this is in terms of acres now, even though that unit of measure says pounds, but it's one acre, 1 1.0000 acres, okay? And then that, this quantity is just brought in into the program. Uh, the, 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 agric uh, the AMS has, has multiplied that, uh, has come up with that number for 62,570 pounds, the CCC uh, payment quantity, okay? Agriculture Marketing Service has come up with that. And then the rate is two cents. So that, uh, that amount times for this one acre times two cents is $1,001. So those three payments added together are the payment for the carrots. Um, let's go back to the data entry again, please. <clears throat> so that total there then is, uh, is uh, for this, for this uh, illustrated example, uh, the number in the red there, is away on the top is uh, $79,811.90. So I quickly went through that, but it's very easy. All you really have to do is, if you have to know a few dates and you have to know your production and just enter it in. And Brian, if you will also click on that yellow bar or the actually the blue box called go to AD3114. And this is what's very slick. It, it, it automatically puts those numbers in your FSA form and you, you either sign it and scan it and send it in or mail it in, uh, very slick. So with that, excuse me for the technical difficulties, actually the electricity just came back on right, right, right when I got done here. So, uh, uh, and if I, can, I can stay online here and answer any questions you may have. So, thank you. All right, thanks, Ron. I think it went went over pretty well. I tried to keep up um, and uh, make sure that we were on the same page, and I, I think it went over all right. So that pretty much concludes everyone's uh, presentation for this uh, uh, in conjunction with FSA and NDSU. And so at this time, I believe Miranda uh, may be available to help, and we're going to start addressing some of the questions that were posted. Um, and the, the very first question we had was regarding uh, yellow peas. And the question was, I'm wondering if there's a chance of amendments to include pulse crops and yellow peas. And if I'm not mistaken, that was addressed um, pre by a previous presenter if they wanna expound upon this. But those that have not been included, there is an opportunity for individuals to go in and type a reason why this crop should be uh, included that was not included in the in the original version of this CARES Act. So if anyone would like to expand upon that. I can expand on that. This is Laura Heinrich. Um, you were correct. Um, so pulse crops such as chickpeas um, and then yellow peas, they and any dry edible bean are not eligible at this time. Um, only fresh and processed um, beans are eligible. So as Jay explained um, in the cattle portion, and I mentioned under the specialty crops, if, if producers or commodity groups feel like their commodity should be included in, in the program, they should go out to the um, farmers.gov slash CFAP, and they can go down to where it talks about the notice of funding availability, and they can make a comment there and justify why their particular commodity should be included. 
Yes, and I believe that also uh, chickpeas and garbanzo beans in the specialty crop part G, they're not in the Excel worksheet. Correct, and that that's, they're not included in the program at this time. Right, okay. Also, Mar go ahead. Oh, several questions in the chat box as well. Um, and so the first one that was there was directed to Laura as well, and is what is the the CCC 36 assignment code for the for the C CFAP program, and should we use the program for now? You can enter 2020 as the program year for assignments, and you're going to enter CFAP as the program. Um, FSA just got our yesterday. We just got our funding. Um, codes to load into the software to um, make sure that the payments go to that assignment. Um, so county offices can start loading those as of today. Um, so if any banks and producers want to assign their CFAP payment, um, they can use that CCC 36. The program year is going to be 2020 and then the program is CFAP. Before we move on to our next question, I'm, I'm going to launch a poll and we can keep moving forward with the questions, but we just have a couple questions for you guys regarding um, what you thought of today's program in terms of usefulness. All right, so I'm going to go back to our Q&A box. Um, and the next question, how are legal entities asked to prove the 500 hours per member of production or management hours? This is uh, Ron Duvall answer that question. Um, first, first, I just want to just make a, a little correction there is that the, the legal entities, the individuals have to provide 400 hours of labor and management. So when it comes to when it comes to this 400 hours, what's going to happen is each each legal entity is going to certify to the names of the members that provide those 400 hours of active personal labor and active personal management or a combination of those. Now, I, this, this question may be alluding to how is the county office going to look at those later, like if we're reviewing or something. And, and I just want everyone out there to know that, that our local county committees are responsible for overseeing all our programs really in the office. And so what's gonna happen is they're given a discretionary, they're given discretion to be able to decide whether someone is, whether they think they're providing that labor or not. So what's gonna happen is, is if the county committee, if there's a question by one of our county employees or a county committee member, then they may ask for some kind of proof from that entity for those individuals. Now, that being said, this is, like I said, it is a certification, but the county committee could ask for that. So what would be a proof? Proof could be um, maybe they, the, that person would just call and talk to the county committee and th conduct an interview and the county committee could make their decision based on that, or uh, uh, they could ask for a statement or of, of what that producer does in the entity or maybe they could provide time cards or something like that. Um, now, one thing to remember that this rule was, was intended to capture bona fide labor being provided by members so that the entities aren't, aren't hit with not earning more for what they, what they produce. And so then one question I just wanna ask everyone to ask themselves when they're filling out that document just ask yourself do you provide the 400 hours okay thank you so next question posed if malting barley is contracted does it qualify under the unpriced rule this is brian hogan i'll take that one um Again, going back to the slides that we went through, um, the malting barley is eligible and the quantity um, eligible as of January 15th, 2020 uh, needs to be at price risk. So if the malting barley on that date or prior 
was under contract with an agreed upon price for a future date, it would not be eligible uh, for CFAP eligibility for payment. Okay, and I believe that answers our next question as well. All right, so another question. In a general partnership, all individuals fill out a, an application and all individuals use total production numbers? A general okay. partnership is the entity, so the partnership would be uh, completing the application. The entity itself reporting actual production and quantities at price risk as of January 15th for the entity, the general partnership. And this is Ron, just to add to that too, the eligibility will be filled out the same way. So the general partnership is gonna fill out the eligibility paperwork and then all the payments, the payment earned is gonna to go to the general partnership, but then it's gonna be attributed out to the individuals that are within that partnership in the background based upon their share. Okay, another question here. This is basically if a small grain crop was hayed because of damage, um, is it gonna be converted and used in this program uh, and, and its eligibility? Yeah, this is Brian. The answer to that is if it's one of our CFAP eligible commodities um, that is harvested as hay, it would be eligible. Again, we would be converting uh, the quantity of hay. Uh, that would be according to slide 36, uh, converting that to bushels for payment. And of course, uh, to follow up, and we talked earlier about recording uh, production, um, any appraised production or assigned production under RMA it, uh, is excluded. And again, this is a production program. Okay. There are um, several different questions that are similar related to um, the eligibility of different crops produced from, for forage um, for both sale and then if it was fed. So from millet to oats, barley, alfalfa, any of those type of forage crops, what's eligible there? Uh, this is Brian again. Uh, crops in a mixture uh, would not be eligible. Alfalfa is not eligible as a non-specialty crop. Um, uh, millet uh, is eligible uh, with an intended use of uh, forage, grain, or seed. Uh, I guess I will yield to uh, you, Ron. Can you help me on a compliance standpoint uh, for acreage reporting, uh, how millet would be classified outside of millet itself? Sorry, Brian, what was that? Yeah. For acreage reporting, when we identify millet, is there a separate uh, variety for uh, specific to uh, forage millet? Of course, under CFAP, our eligibility is limited just to millet. So that's why we're going to defer to you. Yeah, you let can... me look in my handbook here. We'll circle back on that one, Miranda, if we can. Uh, real quick, Brian. Um... I had a question about malt, uh, malting barley versus feed barley quality. Um, this has kind of come up. If, if you filled out your form basically uh, under the assumption that it was malting barley quality and it turns out it got graded feed barley, then do you have to pay back the money that you had received uh, because of the higher grade and it turned out you only had uh, feed grade barley? Yeah, again, based on slide 34, um, this CFAP eligibility is, is limited to uh, quantities that are delivered and graded as uh, malting barley. Um, so I think I've seen that question if the individual, you know, had already been paid and uh, it delivered and it turned out to be feed barley, uh, eligibility is limited to malting. Uh, so we will entertain revisions to applications up through August 28th. And I have a real quick, oh, sorry, go ahead. Now this is Ron, I just was gonna um, just let you know that millet is reported, there's different categories, there's common, dove, prozo, foxtail, Japanese, and pearl. And then those will be all reported as forage, grain, grazing, left stand, or seed. Um, and here's a question for Jay real quick. Um, and this has to go with intent. Is a replacement heifer that's below 600 pounds considered an all other cattle or a feeder calf, basically? 
So because you would tend to keep them for breeding, is it a feeder calf or is it all other animals? Yes, hi, this is Jay, and, and breeding cattle that are intended to be kept in your herd for breeding would go under the all other category. Thank you. And I guess we'll stick with Jay here. Uh, we had another question. Uh, lives, how, how does one obtain the dollar amount used to determine the average between 113 and 117 and then the, the April dates? Is it a set countywide number, for instance, obtained at a local market? The payment rates set for the livestock portion of the CFAP program are a nationwide rate. There's no county specific rates. Uh, the markets and surveys that were done by USDA, I don't have the information what futures, what livestock auctions, et cetera, were used to collect that data. But again, it is a, the, the, the slides where we presented those rates, those are the rates for the nation based on those market surveys that were done. Thank you. And then we had a question, do, do oats and barley for hay qualify? I believe we've answered that in a, in a previous point. Go ahead, Miranda. Similar to that um, is corn that was harvested for, is for earlage or silage. What's the eligibility of that and what would the conversion factor be if it is eligible? Yeah, this is Brian. Uh, corn uh, that is harvested as silage um, would be eligible for uh, CFAP. In addition to that conversion factor, we have that on slide 35. If corn was harvested as earlage, uh, again, we would convert that to uh, bushels for eligibility. And uh, we do have a forthcoming uh, conversion factor to assist producers with that. It's currently not uh, publicized, but uh, we'll have that available in the very near future. Okay, and then a uh, question, this is gonna be on, uh, I guess, compliance. What type of records will be accepted for uh, livestock producers uh, for inventory verification? In other words, will all producers be required to provide verification or only those that are spot checked? I think that one would be for Ron for uh, Actually, I think, Jay, can you answer that question on what documentation they can provide for verification of their numbers? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Uh, as far as for livestock, we would look at purchase and sales documents that they may have. Again, we would look at their contemporaneous records for uh, calving records, if you're a cow-calf operation, uh, any of those types of records that would be able to support the numbers and in inventory, uh, it may be, uh, again, contracts that were entered into for a certain number that were sold that meet the requirements. Those are the documents we would be looking for. And in, re and in regards to those producers who need to provide that documentation, it's just gonna be those who are selected for spot check. Not everyone will have to be have to provide the documentation. Documentation, this, just those that are selected. Okay, we had a question real quick on the conversion factor for corn silage tonnage to bushels. We we have that in the presentation, so you can go back and watch the recording. And uh, Brian had laid that out there, and uh, he he can tell you the slide, but. Yeah, it's slide thirty-five there, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. And the slides will be posted on the on the website as well, so you don't have to watch the whole presentation to get to get to that point again. Um, another question from the chat box is, is: If you farm in two states, do you need to submit two separate applications, or would you just do one? I'll take that one, Amanda. This or Miranda. This is Laura. Um, you're only going to file one application, and it'll include all of your acreage in all counties in the United States. It will be included on one application. Um, another question, I don't know if we're qual uh, able to ask, answer this, but uh, basically the payments, are they going to be considered uh, income and therefore taxed? Is this taxable income? Anyway. Anyone want to field that? Brian, do you want to or do you want me? 
it's um, I can weigh in on that. I mean, we haven't been uh, provided any guidance to the contrary that uh, all indications are now that these payments that uh, are earned are program payments that would be populated uh, at year calendar year end on the uh, 1099 form. A uh, quick question then uh, on this, if your wheat got zeroed out because we had a lot of wheat with bad falling numbers last year, is it eligible for a payment despite receiving the full crop insurance payment for your for your wheat that was essentially destroyed? Well, I mean, again, um, the CFAP program is a production program. Uh, so as mentioned, if there was a signed production or appraised production on crop insurance, those quantities would not be reported uh, on the application form. Um, however, uh, let's look at the, an example where an individual produced 10,000 bushels of wheat, but uh, for crop insurance, due to quality falling numbers, that quantity was adjusted to 8,000 bushels. Um, the producer still has 10,000 bushels in the bin to be marketed. And again, this is a, um, a production program. So those 10,000 bushels uh, are going to be subject to price risk when sold. So that would be the quantity that would be reported. So that would be an ex example where our numbers may differ from that of crop insurance. Thank you. So I have a question uh, regarding our harvested acres from 2019 and if they would be eligible. Yeah, this is Brian again. And as far as the 2019 acreage needs to be harvested at the time of application to be entered onto the application form. However, we fully realize that there's uh, lots of acreage of corn yet that are unharvested. Um, so uh, the producer can uh, apply on uh, all crops that uh, harvest is done at this time and wait till they're done harvesting their corn. Or on the flip side of that, they could come in and uh, apply today on bushels that are actual production bushels from 2019 of harvested. And if sometime, uh, you know, later this summer, before the application deadline of August 28th, the producer is able to get to those uh, corn acres and get them harvested, uh, we'll certainly entertain that application being revised so the producer can include then that actual production for 20, from 2019. All right, thanks, Brian. A uh, quick question here: What is the time frame for the four hundred the the four hundred hour requirement? In other words, I believe that how long of a duration do you have to tally up the four hundred hours? Well, we're gonna we're gonna consider like the crop year or the year as that four hundred hour time frame. Thank you, Ron. I have a question, um, is, are, the, are futures and options in a trading hedge account treated the same as elevator contracts? This is Brian, I guess without seeing the specifics of those contracts, uh, we have to in turn answer that, uh, you know, with a question and the question being, um, did the producer as of January 15th have price risk? Um, if those contracts uh, that were referenced uh, uh, had a agreed upon uh, price in the future um, and they were executed on or before January 15th, the quantity would be ineligible. Understood. Uh, one question that had come up that we, uh, this would go to you again, Brian, but um, if somebody uses options, a lot of times that mitigates the price risk, but it's not a one for one as it is with like a futures contract. So in other words, you know, you're, you're partially risk covered with an option, but not fully risk covered with an option in terms of price risk. So that was a question that I had also had and others had asked about with respect to an option that because it doesn't seem as though there's a partial, uh, a way to, I mean, you can adjust bushels or something possibly, but to, to account for that fact. Now, option uh, contracts are referenced uh, in our slide 45, um, where we differentiated between the uh, five contracts uh, on the previous slide that USDA had determined uh, do provide a 
price risk. And if a producer had one of those on it before January 15th, uh, would be eligible. Um, on slide 45, uh, USDA identified uh, contracts such as the cash contracts, uh, hedge to arrive, listed there as well, Brian, is an options contract that uh, if that was in place as of January 15th, uh, that quantity under the contract would be ineligible. Thank you. I have no more questions in the, oh, never mind. Had a new one. Uh, are appraised acres that never got harvested but had an appraisal completed eligible? The answer to that is no. Um, again, this is a production program. Uh, we're looking for uh, totals for 2019 harvested production and, and the quantities as of January 15th that were subject to price risk. Uh, so again, just like our um, 2019 corn that is still unharvested, that's in the field, uh, that would, is not eligible to be included on the app uh, and until harvested. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, we will take apps today uh, for CFAP commodities. And if uh, weather cooperates and the producer is able to get out there and get that uh, crop harvested, we'll allow the application to be revised through August 28th. And I have one final question. It's for Jay. Can you give an example of a class of livestock that would not be, out, that are not at price risk? Class of livestock, uh, excuse me, I'm back. Uh, the class of livestock does not dictate whether or not they're at price risk. It's, it's the uh, potential for a contract or a sale that occurred for any class of livestock that would determine whether or not they're at price risk. Thank you, Jay. Okay, so with that, we are coming up on two hours. Uh, so we're going to uh, conclude the, the meeting here shortly, uh, the webinar. I want to thank, uh, first of all, everyone who uh, logged in and, and attended this live. You asked some great questions. Uh, NDSU, we would like to thank uh, FSA for helping put this on. This was very informative and, and necessary. Um, and our, our presenters uh, did a great job. And I, I hopefully uh, cleared a, a lot of the air on what, what this program is, what it isn't, and sort of the mechanics on how it works. Um, the contact information, if folks have any specific questions that are highly detailed, has been shown in the, in the presentation in the previous slides was, was laid out there. And also, this will be, again, posted online, as, as Miranda had uh, mentioned. So uh, with that, I, 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 we are finished here. I'll turn it to Miranda real quick if she has any concluding remarks that she would, she would like to say. No, I have no additional remarks. Um, so thank you all for joining us and, and for those of you that stuck with us for the full two hours. And if you have any questions, like Brian said, just reach out to the speakers. Their con contact information is in the slides. And uh, uh, one last opportunity, would FSA, um, anyone from our panelists have any final concluding thoughts? I just wanted to say thank you to NDSU, to Brian and Miranda. You guys always willing to assist us in getting information out on our programs um, to assist our producers is very much appreciated and, and so beneficial. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank everyone very much. Um, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for watching. And hopefully this has been worth your time. Thank you.